may be seated. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, for this was what the prophet was, has written. But you, Bethlehem and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a real ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Herod called them Magi, found out from them the exact time the star had appeared, and he sent them off to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way. The star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left the country by another route. These are the words from the Lord in the house of the Lord. Three kings. We have three kings because we have three gifts. Because it says so. It does say that in the Bible, that there were three gifts. It does not say there were three kings. It does not say how big of a, of a caravan they must have traveled with. It doesn't say how many hundreds of people maybe came with them. It may have been quite an impressive array that showed up in King Herod's court to scare the life out of him. When somebody comes to the king and says, okay, where is this new king that's been born? Okay. <laughs> if you're the old king, you don't like that much at all. It's kind of like, well, it's kind of like club president. How many of you belong to a club that had a president for 10 years or more consecutively? <laughs> Hard to get him out of there, right? <laughs> Somebody said, I'd like to be president. They, they don't want them around anymore. Herod had a good thing going, and it, went, it, it meant that he could, he could leave things to his son, and his son's sons could be king. And now someone comes from another country. Some come, someone comes who's supposed to be a wise man and says, where is the king? I'm here. I'm here. No, you're not. That's not what God has said. And, and all of the prophecies, Matthew really, the Gospel of Matthew really points out all the way through how important he thought the fact that Jesus was fulfilling all of these prophecies, especially from Isaiah. How important it was that, because not only did God, Christ say, I did not come to change the law, I came to fulfill the law and the prophecies. So all of these things are true. Now, we put, we put out manger scenes. We had a really nice one here. It had camels and it had kings, and, and it was absolutely wrong because when the kings came, he was not in the manger. It even says in the book he was in the house. They went to the house where he was. Now, we're not sure. We think probably he was still in Bethlehem because probably Joseph found employment there. And he was waiting a while to take his son home. We don't know. It gets pretty unclear at times. You know, God is good about that, isn't he? God is good about talking to you in ways that you have to be willing to interpret them, too. If everything was black and white, if everything was written down line for line, if every word was just clear and in its meaning, God would be pretty darn boring. And he'd have to say some really bad things about most of us. 
That's just the way it would be. So what do we, why do we, why do we honor the kings? Because they were the first who came to say, this is a king. They were the first to call Christ a king. And they brought gifts. They brought gold because gold is what you bring kings. Anything less than gold is an insult. They bought frankincense. Because quite frankly, their air conditioning was terrible and palaces stunk. <laughs> and so the kings could afford this expensive stuff to make their place smell good. So that we would be a pleasant place for them to be. Because kings don't like to be put out at all. They like everything kind of nice for them. And myrrh, myrrh is the ultimate tribute. Because myrrh is part of a, a salve that you would use to anoint a dead body. So they came to welcome or to or, ordain the king of the Jews because their studies in another land had told them that this is what was going to happen. And they came to fulfill their prophecies, their studies, their learning. Well, what difference does that make to us? It's a good story. Two good hymns. Two good hymns we sing. Three, we three can I like that song. We might sing it again in July. <laughs> so it's a good song. You ought to sing it again. That's why we do Joy to the World once a month or so. We have good hymns. It's a good story. It sets the stage for what Herod does next in trying to be assured that there are no new kings to take over for his family. And he commits the, the, the most horrific massacre you can imagine. And yet it places... God in the position of protecting that which is his. And that's where we can get confidence about the word that's written. Why didn't, why didn't they go back to Herod? Why did God send them home by another route? Well, obviously, if they had gone back to Herod, he would have found out exactly where Jesus was. He would have found out exactly where he needed to go. And we're looking at a we're looking at a time period that's in the indefinite. We're not sure how old Jesus was when they got there. We do know, we do know that Herod backed up and took a two-year period in which to create no boys available. Kill them all. So in this indefinite period, Jesus even went to Israel, or to Egypt. Jesus was saved by his parents. Jesus began to fulfill the prophecies that he said he came to fulfill. And it's important that he fulfills those prophecies because this is what we base our faith on, are the promises of God made from the beginning. And I'm not sure... I'm not a literalist, so I'm not sure that I can explain away seven days or creation. I don't need to. I can believe in creation, and you pick the time period. Maybe God decided the day is, you know, the old story is that the fellow who prayed to God and said, now is it true that a minute's like a thousand years? And God said it is. And he said, is it true that a dollar is like a million dollars? And he said, it is true. He said, I'd like a dollar. And God said, in a minute. <laughs> we want to define God. And we can't. We want to limit God so that he fits our imagination or our knowledge or our, our ability to understand. And you can't. But you cannot do with God is to be confident in the promises that he's made to us. He did, time after time, he did for the nation of Israel what he thought they needed to become his people. 
and they would be for a while, but then when it got to be too much trouble and when it was easier to throw a party with the pagans, marry the pagans, do all that stuff, he simply had to start over again and again and again. And, and that's what ought to give us confidence that, that we're important to him. Maybe we haven't noticed when we started over. Maybe some of us have started over and the rest of you haven't caught up yet. I don't know. I simply know that the story of the Magi is important because it fulfills the prophecy that was made in Isaiah. It fulfills a prophecy that pronounces the promises of God as good and true. And therefore, the other promises of God, we can count on. I took geometry in high school. Anybody take geometry in high school? Anybody like geometry in high school? No. I liked it. He said, no. Our teacher said to three of us smart outs in class, he said, I, I need you to write a proof for trisecting an angle. We spent hours, hours, and hours, and you can't do it. Even Euclid couldn't do it. But we don't, not, there, there's so much about things like that that we don't understand, but there are proofs and axioms and, and truth in geometry that you have to live with or you can't do geometry. There are proofs and, and axioms in life that we have to believe in or we can't believe, live a complete and fulfilled life. And those are the promises of God, demonstrated in the prophecies of God, lived out in the life of Jesus Christ, and all of those surrounding characters who brought him to us to fulfill the story that we might truly believe what God has promised. Though it sounds beyond our, beyond our belief, beyond our ability to understand, we can believe. And probably the greatest of truth is that Christ came to us at a time when the world most needed him. Even though we look at today's world and wonder if this isn't the time that we need him. And that's good because we have him. We have him in our hearts. We have him in our minds. We have him in our whole being. He shared with his disciples on that fateful night the Seder the special meal, the symbolism of release from bondage in Egypt and now the release from bondage in slavery. He took the bread and he held it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying to them, this is my body broken for you. Take eat that you might be one in me and I in you. Likewise, he took the cup at the end of the meal and he held it high and he said to them, this is my blood. My life poured out for you. This is the cup of the new covenant. Lest you share this cup, you share not the promise of everlasting life. <coughs> Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we, we abide here in your created world, in this kingdom where you've called us to be laborers. It's our prayer that we'd be one in the spirit, one with each other, one in ministry to all those around us who need you. So help us, Lord, to be the ones who can show that you are truly here in this place, in this hour. As we come to share the bread and the cup, Lord, let it truly become the body and the blood of Jesus Christ as we accept it as such. Now be with us, Lord, as we lift our voices as one and say this prayer for you. Our Father, Amen who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. He invites you to his table. I would ask those who are going to assist to come forward at this time that you might share with me.